hello and welcome to uh, another lecture for our uh, second week here in Synoptic Gospels. Uh, this uh, lecture is going to be on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark focuses on Jesus as the suffering servant of God. Uh, this is not a very pleasant Gospel. Uh, if we read it on its own, it's, it's sort of dark. But we should reflect on that uh, darkness uh, and what, what would the purpose of that be likely? Uh, why would someone write a gospel that is uh, dark? It's likely that Mark is writing to persecuted Christians. So there's uh, a lot of comfort in knowing that your Messiah also suffered. That the one who came to save you also had a very, very unpleasant life. So it seems like that's what Mark's trying to get at for us uh, in his gospel. So let's uh, take a look at some of the, the background ideas here. Um, this is, uh, it's not as Jewish as uh, Matthew, for instance, but it is a, a Jewish gospel. Uh, the opening is uh, that it's the good news of uh, Jesus uh, the Christ, and Christ, Christos in Greek, is uh, the translation for Mashiach of Hebrew, and, and that is uh, Messiah in Hebrew. And so this is a claim about who or uh, what is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah. And in the Jewish worldview, there, there are a lot of ideas for this, right? That it, the Messiah is a king, the Messiah is a deliverer, um, definitely at the very least a, a powerful figure. Um, in the first century, they're likely expecting someone that's going to take care of Rome. Mark also opens uh, by emphasizing Jewish scripture. Um, he uh, quotes Isaiah, and uh, this is a blended quote somewhat um, with uh, uh, Hosea, I believe. Uh, he blends Isaiah and Hosea, I think. Uh, but this indicates that Mark is concerned with, uh, with Old Testament fulfillment. We also have, uh, as I said before, the gospel for people with ADD. And this isn't intended uh, to be uh, pejorative towards anyone with ADD. Um, uh, you know, neurodiversity is, uh, is an important thing. And so just want to be clear here that I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, cast any stones there. Um, um, one of my children is neurodiverse. I uh, also have some suspicions that I may be as well. And so I'm not, not trying to um, make fun of anybody here. Uh, just trying to say, like, you know, the, the stereotype for, for someone with ADD is uh, sort of that rapid kind of and this and this and this and this and this, right? That's kind of the stereotype. And if you can think of that um, with regard to Mark, um, that's helpful, right? He uses the, the Greek word euthus immediately, ten times in the first chapter, and about 40 times in the rest of his gospel. By comparison, it occurs uh, 50 times elsewhere in the New Testament. And so, uh, this is a lot. You have, and immediately Jesus did this, and immediately he 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 did this. And it's just very frantic, right? Very fast-paced, and uh, just pushing forward. Right, uh, Gospel of Mark is also sort of a, a case study in paradox. This is another uh, major theme uh, for Mark that Jesus is both the powerful Messiah and also dramatically resisted and misunderstood. Uh, that uh, ironically, the demons are the ones that seem to understand Jesus the best in the Gospel of Mark. If the charisma and the charisma, if you're unfamiliar with that word, just means the the core of the gospel, the proclamation of the early church. Uh, if the charisma was essentially a narrative about divine triumph, despite and indeed through human suffering, then arguably there's no other text in which this paradox comes into crisper expression than in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark goes out of his way to show the disciples as confused and the demons as understanding. Right? This is exactly the opposite of what you expect. Okay, as a dark gospel, as I mentioned before, with Jesus dying alone and in dark desolation, with only a single utterance on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this, uh, as I said before, uh, continues that theme of fulfillment of scripture. This is a quotation of Psalm 22. Um, psalm 22 is a lament psalm uh, which is expressing the uh the depths of despair and separation from god and so jesus is identifying this with this personally 
Uh, it also ends without appearances to his followers, leaving, leaving the reader panicked, frantic, and concerned. Now there's some debate there regarding the ending of Mark. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but uh, the best evidence is that the longer ending of Mark is, is, is likely not original. Okay, so we'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, Mark is commonly ignored in the early church. Uh, this is largely because of the overlap with Matthew, 90% uh, overlap. Additionally, Matthew was an apostle. Mark and Luke were not. Uh, Augustine calls Mark a foot slave and abbreviator of uh, Matthew, uh, which seems odd given that uh, Matthew has the Sermon on the Mount. You wouldn't think someone would delete that. Uh, and But it takes a very, very long time for anybody to propose Mark and priority that Mark is first. You know that happens to be the best evidence. Now there are still some people who who argue for Matthean priority, and you know there's there's cases to be made for that. But uh, it seems like our best evidence is pointing towards Mark being the first gospel, uh, and probably one of the earliest things written in the New Testament. Um, and so uh, this is mostly because Mark seems undeveloped and uh, seems to be kind of uh, primitive. Uh, his Greek is not very polished. Matthew's is more polished and Luke's is way more polished. Luke is uh, much better at Greek uh, than uh, virtually anybody in the New Testament. Uh, uh, Luke's Greek is, is challenging. So uh, Mark is a Greco-Roman biography. Um, and uh, so we talked about that before. Uh, ancient biography sets uh, its focus on the protagonist from the beginning and seeks to sustain that focus throughout, not least by constantly making the hero the subject of the narrative's verbs. Uh, there also, are also formal similarities such as length and scale, uh, and uh, this, this holds up with Mark. We see this in Mark. Uh, this seems to have, been, have, have won most recent scholarship, although it's usually qualified in several ways. In other words, the Gospels are bios, uh, but they are reworked bios. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can see uh, work by Mike Lacona on why are the differences in the Gospels and uh, Richard Burridge on uh, what are the Gospels. Uh, those are the most recent works on this. Uh, you should check those out if you're interested in this topic. Okay. Um, Lacona, for instance, uh, and this is from one of his lectures on YouTube, uh, which is in my notes here on um, this PowerPoint. So if you're interested in watching that video, you can. Uh, Lacona is persuaded and argues that Jesus' claim to divinity in Mark only makes sense in light of Greco-Roman biography. Uh, John is uh, fulfillment of uh, is of fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in 40 verse 3. And by preparing the way of Yahweh, uh, that means that uh, Jesus is Yahweh. Right? If John's preparing the way for Jesus, but the, the uh, prophecy in Isaiah is to prepare the way for Yahweh, then Jesus is Yahweh. Mark chapter 2, Jesus forgives sins of the paralytic, only God can forgive sins. Uh, Jesus says that his exorcisms have bound Satan, how can a human possibly do that? Uh, Jesus calms the wind, which only God can do, and you can cross-reference this with uh, Psalm 89, Psalm 107, and Ecclesiastes 8. Uh, uh, Mark chapter 5, Jesus raises someone from the dead. Only God can do that. Again, cross-referencing that with Ecclesiastes 8. Uh, Jesus walks on the water in Mark 6, which is something only God can do. You can cross-reference that with Job 9-8. And there's also a verse in the Psalms about that, though I forget exactly where it's at. Uh, Mark chapter 7, Jesus casts out a demon that only comes out by uh, prayer to God. And yet, strikingly there, Jesus doesn't pray. So he says this only comes out by prayer and fasting. Uh, yet we don't see Jesus praying or fasting in that moment, and so that seems to indicate some sort of distinction there uh, between Jesus and his disciples. Uh, Mark chapter 12, Jesus is not only David's son, but his Lord. Uh, and uh, this is uh, from uh, uh, Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, which is often confusing in the English Bible, but if you read it in Hebrew, it's, uh, and Yahweh said to Adonai, Yahweh being the proper name for God, Adonai being uh, the Hebrew word for Lord, but the proper name for God, Yahweh, often gets translated as Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, which leads to some confusion in that passage. Uh, Mark 12 and 13, uh, Jesus is in a special relationship with God as Son, above all prophets, priests, and kings. And then Mark 12 to 14, Jesus is the apocalyptic Son of Man who receives worship, something only fit for God. Uh, and here, uh, Son of Man being a reference to Daniel chapter 7, uh, which we will talk about in a later lecture, uh, is really key for understanding uh, this early identity of Jesus 
uh, in the uh, early Christian communities. Jesus calls himself son of man more than anything else. And uh, understanding that Old Testament context for that title is just crucial. Uh, but like I said, we'll talk about that in a later lecture. So uh, structure for Mark, there's some debate. Uh, generally speaking, uh, a lot of people go for a bipartite or a uh, two-piece structure of Mark. That's, in fact, what I've suggested to you in a previous lecture, uh, where um, you've got uh, two major pieces, two major acts. Um, you've got Jesus' ministry, and then you've got uh, Jesus' suffering. And the hinge there is Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah. There's also a tripartite argument um, to say that um, there are three parts. Uh, Peter's confession indicates transition from one to two, and then Jesus' entry into Jerusalem indicates two to three. And so instead of a, a climax, the emphasis here is on the way section, which is uh, chapter 8, 22 to 10, 46, which makes frequent use of the word hados, which is the Greek word for way, uh, to highlight the unexpected suffering of Jesus' messiahship. Uh, I'm a little bit more convinced by the bipartite, argument but you know there's there's some evidence there for tripartite you can also outline it based on geography the prologue leads up to uh, about halfway through uh, the first chapter then we have galilee further galilee beyond galilee journey to jerusalem and then jerusalem that seems to line up fairly well um, there are also some people who argue that mark has no structure at all so that's uh, just worth tossing out there um, and there's also a thematic outline and so uh, you know we can take a look at uh, um, what uh, themes we have here. We have prologue, uh, right, and that goes up to about halfway through the first chapter. And then for the first half, and this kind of follows the bipartite, first half we have revelation and rejection. We see we get Jesus' authority, uh, and then under that we have Jesus' revelation, and then Jesus' rejection. You know, teaching and mir miracles, Jesus' revelation of that, and then his rejection. Then we have mission, Jesus' revelation of that, and then rejection. And then, uh, and this is keeping with the paradox study, right? We have prediction and misunderstanding. So we have revelation and rejection in the first half of the gospel. Now we have prediction and misunderstanding. The way of discipleship, prediction and misunderstanding. Jesus predicts the passion, disciples misunderstand. And we have the transfiguration. Then we have Jesus predicts his passion, and then we have arguing confusion and misunderstanding. Now this transfiguration here that's bold, italicized, and has the, the asterisks there, this is something that we're going to talk about in a moment called intercalation, where you have, uh, say, uh, you know, something occurring, and you have something different from that, and then you have a parallel to the uh, earlier occurrence. Okay, and so we have prediction and misunderstanding here. We have prediction and misunderstanding. Uh, and then we have the transfiguration kind of sandwiched in between. This is something that Mark does a lot of. Uh, and so this may be an instance of sort of a larger form of intercalation uh, in Mark. And then you have conflict with the temple leaders and then passion and resurrection. And so this is perhaps a thematic outline for uh, the Gospel of Mark. Okay, Intercalation uh, is... Uh, consistently used in Mark, okay, and then, so there's some people that even see just the whole of his gospel as concentric intercalations. So here's an example of this, right? Uh, we have Beelzebul, we have the family controversy in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, and we have the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in 22 to 30, and then we have family controversy again, right? We have the raising of Jairus' daughter and the woman with the issue of blood, uh, and Jairus' request, and the woman with the issue of blood, and then Jairus' daughter is healed. And so the woman with the issue of blood is, is sandwiched right in there. And it seems like, you know, intercalations like this, they're, they're trying to make a point. Now, with each individual one, uh, we, we want to think through what's happening in the context of the passage to try to figure out what's uh, what the point is there. Uh, but to give you a few other examples, and then, then we'll talk about one in, in particular here. Um, here are a few others. We have the sending of the twelve, and Herod's banquet is uh, sandwiched in between the sending of the twelve and their return. We have the cursing of the fig tree, the cleansing of the temple, and then the, the discussion of the fig tree. Then we have uh, priests and scribes trying to arrest Jesus. Jesus is anointed, and then Judas betrays Jesus. We have Jesus before the council, Peter denies Jesus, and then Jesus before Pilate. And we have the trial, mock cor coronation, and execution. Just to give you one exploration of these, um, the one that I find most striking is the fig tree, uh, where the fig tree is cursed, 
and then the, uh, the temple is cleansed, and then the discussion of the fig tree after that. Uh, now, in Hebrew narrative, uh, in the Old Testament especially, one thing that we often see, and this is similar to intercalation, is we see a repetition of things, and then we see an interruption. And uh, for those of you who were in Biblical Exegesis Practicum with me last semester, you'll remember this, hopefully, um, that we have a repetition of, of something, and then we have an interruption. This is precisely that. We have fig tree, fig tree, and then right in between that, we have the cleansing of the temple. Well, why would this be the case? Well, if we look at the cleansing of the temple uh, surrounded by uh, the cursing of the fig tree, the fig tree is displaying leaves as though it has fruit. But when Jesus approaches it, he realizes that it does not. Um, and this results in it being cursed. Uh, the temple in uh, Mark's gospel at this point is displaying uh, that it has fruit. It's displaying that it is doing what the Lord would want it to do. But when Jesus arrives there, it does not have the fruit. right? And so what we, what we have here is a fig tree uh, sort of um, allegorically, which isn't to say that the fig tree didn't exist, but uh, but the fig tree is sort of allegorically helping us understand the cleansing of the temple. The, the fig tree is the temple. The fig tree is displaying something that it is not actually providing, and the temple is displaying something that it's not actually providing. And so that intercalation is helping us with interpreting the cleansing of the temple. Okay, and this, this is how uh, this works with the rest of these uh, examples in, uh, in the Gospel of Mark. We also have a repetition of three in Mark that happens pretty regularly. Three seed parables, three opinions on John, three opinions on Jesus, three passion predictions, three failures to stay awake, three fold denial, and three affirmations of Jesus' sonship. Um, this is pretty consistent in the Gospel of Mark. We have irony throughout Mark's Gospel. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these in great detail. We've already discussed this a little bit, uh, that uh, Mark uh, attributes knowledge to the demons and ignorance to the disciples, right, that this is uh, what's happening. And so you can take a look at this if you're interested. Uh, the, the information here on uh, uh, irony in, uh, in Mark. Um, one point here that's worth mentioning briefly is this idea of the messianic secret. Uh, it's most pronounced in Mark, uh, but it does occur in the other Gospels. This is something that uh, I often get asked by students is, uh, why does Jesus tell people not to uh, tell anyone about the miracle? It seems as though Jesus wants to be in control of his own narrative uh, and that uh, he's trying to keep the story from spreading faster than he wants it to spread. Because um, he knows where he's going, and so he, he wants to make sure that it's progressing in the, uh, the timing that he wants as opposed to going too fast. Okay? So that's, that's one way of looking at that, that idea of the Messianic secret. Okay? We have a lot of rhetoric um, in, in Mark, and rhetoric, uh, essentially the rhetorical questions are, are a large part of this, um, is uh, uh, there's a, a commentary on this by a New Testament scholar named Ben Witherington. It's a um, rhetorical commentary on uh, the Gospel of Mark. It's really helpful. A lot of uh, what I've been discussing thus far uh, in this lecture is based on that book. So if you're interested in Mark, um, you're uh, be advised to go check that book out. Uh, but just to give you an example here, um, there's a uh, New Testament scholar, Fowler, uh, that is cited by Witherington, and he says that there are 114 questions in Mark's Gospel, and about 77 of them are either unanswered or rhetorical. Okay, and so here are some of the examples of these rhetorical questions, uh, and th this is a, a key element in uh, Mark, in including the uh, ironic sort of idea. And here's kind of a... Um, a grid of some of the more prominent rhetorical questions. What is this, a new teaching with authority? Why does this fellow speak uh, this way? Who can forgive sins but God? Why does he eat with sinners? Why are they doing what is not lawful? Who then is this, that even the wind and the water obey him? Where did this man get this wisdom? And why do your disciples not live by tradition? So these are all rhetorical questions. That doesn't mean that they aren't necessarily uh, expecting some kind of an answer, but uh, um, they're trying to achieve something with the question itself, and the point is not the answer. The point is what they're trying to accomplish with the question. Okay. Um, another uh, look at uh, some interesting parallels in um, the Gospel of Mark. This, I think, is 
particularly fascinating. If you think about uh, the baptism, the transfiguration, and the crucifixion, this is, I think, probably the one of the stronger arguments for uh, threefold structure in Mark. Uh, in the baptism, the heavens are rent and the dove descends. We have a voice from heaven. You are my beloved son. Uh, and then John the Baptist does Elijah. In the transfiguration, the garments turn white and cloud descends. And so we have some heavenly uh, activity. Then we have a voice from the cloud. And then we have, this is my beloved son. Uh, and then we have Jesus appears with Elijah. And then the crucifixion, sanctuary veil is rent. Uh, and the sanctuary veil would have been um, decorated with uh, heavenly depictions. This is what happens in the temple. They're trying to call your mind back to Eden. Uh, Bible Project does a phenomenal job with that, by the way. If you want to look at the video, Heaven and Earth, they did a wonderful job of explaining that. So we have, again, sort of a heavenly uh, parting. Uh, heaven's rent, sanctuary veil is rent, similar things happening there. Uh, and then we have Jesus' great voice from the cross. We have someone saying, truly, this man was the son of God. And then someone asking, is he Elijah? And so these seem to be kind of baptism, transfiguration, crucifixion. They seem to have a lot of a lot of parallels there. So uh, so that's an interesting way of looking at them. And then the ending, ending of Mark. Uh, there are a lot of different perspectives on this. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it, it is debatable. It is sort of an open question. Uh, personally, I think the shorter ending is probably uh, accurate. Uh, really like uh, Strauss's perspective on this, figure 7.9 on 194, uh, if you have the physical textbook. Uh, if you don't have the physical textbook, then uh, uh, it should be in uh, the chapter on Mark. You should have an excursus on the ending of Mark. And uh, I think that that would be... Um, uh, really helpful for you. I, I really like his point there. And the main the main thing that I think is persuasive there is when you're reading it in Greek, um, there is really a sharp shift in vocabulary and style at 16.9, uh, which does seem like just a really strange, um, strange adjustment. Okay, so there is the longer ending. Uh, there is 16.9 to 20. Uh, doesn't seem like it's original, like I said, because the style and vocabulary are so different. Another option is that uh, it's just unfinished. Uh, that's one uh, one theory that's been put out is that uh, that Mark just never got around to finishing it, um, and so there's just it just ends right. Um, and then another option is that he intends a second volume, but he either didn't write it or it's been lost. Uh, this doesn't really address the problem of the ending of Mark, so there's, there's a problem there. One of the reasons that I like the shorter ending is because of the kind of spastic uh, approach to the gospel that he takes of immediately, 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 immediately. It sort of makes sense that he would just have kind of an abrupt ending. And if you read 16.8, it's abrupt. It's it's abrupt, right? If you, if you end there, it's abrupt. And so it makes sense that that kind of an author would have sort of kind of a, an abrupt ending, right? Um, another approach to this, Witherington suggests that there is an actual ending, but we've just lost it. Um, he notes that biographers were concerned to tie up loose ends, uh, shows this in uh, the instance of uh, Plutarch. Uh, he also uh, suggests that Greek grammar, uh, it's, it's just unthinkable that it would end uh, with Ephabunta uh, gar. Uh, gar there is the conjunction, but it's called a post-positive conjunction, which means it's always going to come second in the sentence. It's never going to come first in the sentence. Um, and so it, it's just very odd to have uh, they were afraid because, right? You would translate this because they were afraid, but ending a sentence and in fact an entire book on gar is just strange. Now, having said that, Mark's Greek is strange. So uh, that'd be that that would make sense to a certain degree. So I'm not I'm not sure that I'm convinced by Witherington, though uh, he definitely knows way more about the New Testament than I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm convinced here. So uh, the audience for Mark's Gospel, um, there is a broad uh, disagreement here. Um, the um, there have to be Jews in the audience because he's appealing to Scripture pretty regularly. But it seems like there are also uh, Gentiles in the audience because he makes reference to things that uh, would only really make sense to, to Gentiles. Um, he, 
um, has some Latinisms, uh, and so like the palace that is the Praetorium. The Praetorium is would be the Latin version of the Greek term for palace. So this seems like he's writing to people who are more familiar with Latin than they are with Greek, though they read Greek. Um, his readers uh, were likely converted pagans uh, because he occasionally explains Jewish traditions. So he's concerned with the fulfillment of Scripture, but also concerned with explaining to people who would not know uh, Jewish traditions. So, so there's some conflict there, trying to understand that. Mark himself could have been a Gentile because it's debatable whether or not he understands all of those traditions. Uh, and uh, the Jewishness of the gospel seems like it may be dependent on, on earlier sources. Okay, and that takes care of the gospel of Mark for us. Uh, if you have any questions, please do let me know. Uh, thanks for all your hard work thus far in this course. Look to, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what she has to over the next few weeks.